Welcome to Germ Journal Club. My name is Josh Zuckner. I'm the Director of Cosmetic and Clinical Research in the Dermatology Department at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, and I'm your host. In today's episode, we'll talk about what's new in the pathogenesis and treatment of actinic keratoses. It is my pleasure to introduce a friend and a colleague, Dr. Gary Goldenberg, who is the Medical Director of the Dermatology Faculty Practice at Mount Sinai Medical Center and an Assistant Professor in Dermatology and pathology. Thanks so much for being here, Gary. It's great to be here. As a dermatologist and a dermatopathologist, you really have a unique perspective um, on a lot of the skin conditions that you treat. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's new in the pathogenesis, pathogenesis of actinic keratosis? Sure. You know, actinic keratosis, as you know, is one of the most common things that we treat in dermatology. In fact, if you look at the Medicare population, it's the most common thing that we treat. And there's a lot of debate in our literature exactly what actinic keratosis is. Is it a precancerous lesion? Is it the earliest form of squamous cell carcinoma in situ? And there's a lot of data to support the fact that it's a, there's a direct progression from normal non-sun exposed skin to sun exposed skin to AK to squamous cell carcinoma. For example, there was a recent study that used gene chips that looked at genes going up and down Mm -hmm. in this progression, and you could see a direct, sort of like a stepwise progression between AK and squamous cell carcinoma. We also just finished a study at Mount Sinai looking at the follicular extension of AK. So some actinic keratoses tend to come back after cryosurgery, and we wondered why that happens. And what we did is we looked for AKs that have follicular extension. So this is when atypical keratinocytes sort of go down the infundibulum of the hair follicle in, in the biopsy specimen. And what we found out is that there's a direct correlation between skin cancer, and this is both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer, and follicular extension of actinic keratoses. And in fact, the highest correlation was between melanoma and follicular extension of AK. So as you get our reports from our laboratory, you'll sometimes see actinic keratosis with follicular extension. And that's to sort of tell you that this particular AK or this particular patient may not behave as a regular patient with AK, but may be a little bit of a higher risk. And if you think about this conceptually, there's a reason why AKs come back after cryosurgery. So if you make a blister with cryo and the blister scabs off, the epithelium has to come back from somewhere. And it usually comes back from the skin around it or from the stem cells in the hair follicle. So if the stem cells in the hair follicle have mutations, it's going to come right back as an AK. So I think this is a very important step in understanding this disease process. I know that there have been several publications looking at a population of patients um, from VAs evaluating progression of AKs. Tell us a little bit about some of that research. So one of the biggest studies, or probably will be the biggest study in the history of AK that's not pharmaceutical industry supported, was a study that Marty Weinstock had. It was, it's the VA chemo prevention study using tretinoin. And in this study, the vets were given tretinoin cream to use once or twice a day on their face to see if we can decrease the number of AKs and squamous cell carcinomas that they make. Well, the big news of the study made is that the patients who actually got tretinoin had a higher mortality than those who didn't. And when you controlled for all other variables like hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, the, the correlation was still there. But what's really important about the study is a paper that was published in Cancer that looked at progression of AK to non-melanoma skin cancer, and there are certain uh, statistics from that paper that are very important. One, the most important thing is, is the progression of AK to non-melanoma skin cancer. And in this study, 4% of AK in the period of four years progressed to squamous cell carcinoma, and 2%, and this was a surprising finding, progressed to basal cell carcinoma. So I think when, you, when we think about AK, we don't actually have to think about it as a pre-squamous cell. We should think about it as a pre keratinocyte malignancy, mm -hmm. and there is a risk of progression to both squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. So the big question that I have from this data is, are you going to stop using your tretinoin because of the mortality risk? Well, I'm not using tretinoin. <laughs> I'm writing for Renova or Refisa because those have been studied in the older population for wrinkle reduction. I'm not writing tretinoin, which is approved for use in teenagers and acne. So in teenagers, it doesn't seem like there is a risk of mortality. We would find this out with lots and lots of acne studies that you're an expert in. But in the, in the older population of patients who are using tretinoin for wrinkle reduction, I think you're, you're better off writing for a product that's actually approved for that use. 
Now, if you talk to the authors of the study, they don't actually believe the outcome, but it's there in black and white and paper and print. So I do think it gives me a little bit of pause, and I don't write tretinoin per se anymore. I see. I know that, th that recently there was a new medication that was approved for the treatment of actinic keratosis. Can you comment on what that medication is? Sure. This is a product called Picado, and we were actually one of the sites to do the trials for the product, and it's a topical agent that's approved in two strengths for the treatment of actinic keratosis of the face or scalp, and also there's a different strength to use on the hands, forearms, and chest. And the interesting thing about this product is it's three applications in total for AKs on the face or scalp, and two applications in total on the hands and forearms. The subjects were given the cream, and they applied it to a five by five centimeter squared area. And the efficacy of the drug is about an 80% lesion reduction, which in my mind is really the most important thing about any AK treatment. If you have a patient with 10 actinic keratoses, what I really want to know is how many, how many of them are going to go away with this topical treatment, not really the, the cure rate, which is what the FDA looks at. And the, uh, the lesion reduction was quite good with both of these products. Of course, facial skin did best, as always in every study, on topical uh, AK drugs. Scalp, forearms, and hands did not do as well. But the most interesting thing about this product is the, the duration of application. It's, it's a very short application, so it's three times in a row, so like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for face and scalp, or uh, two days for hands and forearms, so Monday and Tuesday. Now there's a generic version of Eldara available on the market, which is a 5% Amiquimod cream. Tell us what the difference is between that generic medication and the branded uh, Imiquimod 3.75%, which is, uh, goes by the trade name Zyclara. I think the most important difference is the way the studies were designed from, from the inception. When Aldara studies were designed, the patients were treated in a 5 by 5 centimeter squared area, so a 25 centimeter squared area of actinic keratosis. And the regimen was twice a week for 16 weeks. This is where we have most of our data. Hypertrophic AKs were not allowed in the Aldara studies. When Zyclara studies were designed, hypertrophic AKs were allowed. An entire face or scalp could be treated. So a real cosmetic unit, the way we would treat our patients, the way you and I treat our patients, because we don't think of our patients in a 5 by 5 centimeter squared area. So and the, the actual treatment course is much more compact with Zyclara. The cream gets applied overnight for two weeks. The patient takes a two-week break, and then they reapply it for two weeks. Now, the break is actually very important because during that time, at the end of that two-week break, the patient goes back to looking almost to baseline. And the second treatment course with Zyclara is important because some of the AKs which did not light up with the first treatment actually light up in the second treatment. But it's a much more compact six-week course as opposed to twice a week for 16 weeks. So compliance with that is much higher. There are other major differences between Aldara and Zyclara. One of the things that's new and just recently been approved by the FDA is that Zyclara 375% is going to be available in a pump. Now, for a decade, we've been asking for another vehicle than the sachets because I'm sure your patients complain about this. My patients complain about the sachets, especially the older patients with AKs that have arthritis in their hands. It's hard to open the packets. It's hard to squeeze the medication out. The medication is very expensive, so they want to get every little drop. And now it's going to be available in a pump. It's a meter dose pump, which is going to make it much more easy for the patients to use the product. The other study that I want to mention is a study that combined cryosurgery with Zyclara, because in the real world, we don't really use one or the other. We like to combine the two modalities. So in this study, this was a multi-center study. Some AKs were treated with cryosurgery per practitioner's practice, and then lesions were allowed to heal sufficiently, and Zyclara was applied on label. So overnight for two weeks, two-week break, overnight for two more weeks. And what the study showed is that there's actually an added benefit to cure rates if you do cryo and then add Zyclara on top. So the patient's lesions would actually cry out, um, went away more often than not if you used both modalities. So with just plain cryo, the treatment cure rates were not as good as if you used Zyclara afterwards. And we just redid a similar study 
using Zyklar and cryosurgery and hypertrophic AKs on hands and forearms, so stay tuned for those results. Being actively involved in research in actinic keratosis, both on the clinical end and on the pathology end, I think you have a very unique perspective on this condition. What is your approach in treating these patients? So I think that patients that have lots of actinic keratosis, and by that I mean more than 10, really need a paradigm shift in the way we treat AKs. And I think the most important thing is not to either cryo or give a topical, but to combine those two modalities. Because it's important to freeze the hypertrophic AKs, the thicker AKs, but it's also important to treat the entire skin surface because you have to think about it as field cancerization. Because even where you don't see an AK, there are subclinical lesions. And in, in studies, over 80% of patients have had subclinical actinic keratosis. So I think you really should be doing both for your patients with lots of sun damage and lots of actinic keratosis. So combination therapy is the way to go. I think combination therapy is the gold standard for any patient that has multiple AKs, I would say more than 10 actinic keratosis. Great. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, offering your insights on what's new in the pathogenesis and treatment of actinic keratosis. This concludes another edition of Germ Journal Club. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.